Hi everyone, this is um, canine and feline eating behavior and weight management part two. This is week 14 for the class and um, of course that means we are almost finished with your semester. So quick definitions, we um, throughout the semester we've talked about um, animals being overweight, animals being obese, but it's important to know um, what do those what do the terms mean? They are actually clinically defined. Overweight is 10 to 20 percent above ideal body weight. The ideal body weight is the part that often um, can be relatively hard for an owner or even a clinician to um, to really get at because um, a, if we were to think about in human terms, the ideal body weight of a football player would be very different than the ideal body weight of someone um, who is of similar size and stature but doesn't work out to that intensity every day. So um, for your animal, is it is it a long cat? Is it a short cat? Is it, um, you know, long-legged, long-bodied? What, what about it? So the ideal body weight of every Labrador Retriever isn't the same. Every Persian isn't the same. And it's coming to terms with your animal and understanding what is your animal's true ideal body weight. And, um, it really is an individual number, um, not breed, not species, not gender. It's individual. And certainly knowing... The, the species they breed and, and all the specifics help you figure it out, but um, it is still a very individualized number. Obesity um, is technically defined as 20% above that ideal body weight and over. Uh, there are some estimates, some checks that say 25%. For this class, we're just going to go ahead and say 20. Um, again, uh, whichever, if you are at a local veterinary clinic and they use 25, then that's fine, but for us and for this textbook and this class, we're going to use 20% and up, above 20% really because um, the 10 to 20 is in the overweight category. So obesity is the excessive accumulation of fat in the adipose storage units of the body, eventually contributing to adverse effects on health and mortality. So the animal is just um, has more fat than it should. So we're not judging the reason and saying, anything behind it, the animal is just obese. And there could be lots of reasons why. Our job as a nutritionist is to help decrease that problem, not to judge the problem. And that's, um, that can be very hard to do. And the more we, we don't judge the problem, the better our results will be because um, no animal owner wants to be judged for these things. Current statistics on our overweight and obese animals, dogs, approximately 54% of dogs are overweight or obese. Um, these are 2016 Association of for Pet Obesity Prevention Numbers. It's a clinical survey. If you um, type in um, cat obesity, dog obesity, or overweight, or any of that into any search engine right now, you're gonna get all kinds of numbers. Um, but the majority of these numbers are going to be very similar to what I'm presenting here. So roughly 54% of dogs and 59% of cats are at least overweight, if not obese. Around 34% of our dogs have a body condition score between 6 and 8, um, um, and that is overweight, and then approximately 20% are obese, and that's roughly a BCA, BCS between 8 and 9. So Lots of animals in the United States, roughly 42 million dogs, are at a minimum overweight. The cats, the problem is even more severe. So you look at the numbers here, roughly 28% are overweight and roughly 31% are obese. So when you compare the dog and the cat numbers here, so while the 54 and 59 are relatively similar, the obesity numbers are the ones that should jump out at you. There are more obese cats in the United States than there are overweight cats. And um, there are more overweight and obese together than there are underweight. And if you think about these numbers again, people typically don't um, quantify animals as overweight or obese in their first year of growing. So these numbers are probably even higher because there's a percentage of the population we're not even calling out yet. So, um, anyway, um, it's just something that we want to, to think about um, heavily. 
So, I, there, I'm reading this thing down here at the bottom, and I'm, there's a there's a tiny little glitch on it, and that's just um, that should be an an eight here. Some stats call um, a seven obese on this scale, and that's kind of what this number was getting at. But um, but don't don't worry so much about that. I'm I'm sorry for that little typo in here, but we'll we'll move on and just focus on the idea that um, dogs and cats in the United States are, are heavily in trouble with, with regard to their, their weight management. Potential health issues, problems that occur from excess weight both in the cat and the dog um, are on this list here. So there's cardiovascular and pulmonary disease that you're putting all that fat on, it takes animal, um, it's more pressure on their body to function correctly. Again, remember that um, these, the defects that we see from, on humans are not the same as we see in animals because of, um, because of you know, the HDL and LDL and cholesterol and all that. But there's still cardiovascular and pulmonary disease issues that we see in cats and dogs because of them being overweight and obese. There's a lowered immune system. Um, that's across the board. The heavier the animal becomes, um, the lower the immune system is. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Sometimes it's the type of diet that's eaten. Sometimes it's the um, stress that's put on the body. Um, but overall, a lowered immune system. There are some cancer risks that increase as, um, as the animal becomes heavier, in particular with obesity. Um, there's a lot of research in this area, and we're still really um, working on to figure out what's happening there because some researchers think that it's not so much that the cancer risk is increasing as it is that because of the obesity, we're less able to see some of the problems quickly. Um, we assume that it's one thing when it's actually a tumor. We assume that it's you know just a fatty area, and it really isn't. Regardless, um, we know that really obese animals um, are getting cancer at higher levels for some, for some reason. We see an increased liver disease. That's especially true fatty liver disease in cats. We see a lot more um, skin type ailments in both cats and dogs, but particularly cats, um, when the animal becomes overweight and then obese. Some of that is because the animals cannot groom themselves as appropriately or as easily. Uh, and when, even when humans are involved, we're not as good at cleaning the animals either when there's more folds and we're just not as, as, as good at it. But um, there's other um, reasons as well. Exercise and heat intolerance. This is especially true in our brachiocephalic breeds. So our Persians, our Bulldogs, anything with the you know, chronodistrophe type face, um, that's certainly something that we worry about. So um, then we go into your osteoarthritis, joint damage, lameness. The animal is just um, putting more pressure on all of their joints. And the more pressure is there, if you already have a joint that has any type of trouble at all, you're worsening it. And as the animal is aging, the normal arthritic changes that are happening are worse and worse, so um, definitely many joint issues. We um, see an increase in diabetes. This is typically um, more an issue with cats. Um, type 2 in cats is a much more significant concern with this. Um, dogs and type 2 are really not the way we think of type 2 in, in human work, but regardless, we see more diabetes with animals that are heavier. The last one is one that people don't always think about, and that's increased surgical risk. The animal, um, because of the, the cardiovascular, the pulmonary disease, and the liver disease, and the exercise, the heat intolerance, all that, there are increased surgical risk. There's also increased anesthesia risk. So there's a lot of potential health issues for our animals putting on that excess weight. The bottom line is here, almost at the bottom, and that's a reduced quality of life. And likely reduced quantity of life. So you have an animal who's less able to function as it should, is less able to play, is less able to jump, is less able to do the things that our cats and dogs are supposed to be able to do, and it's because ultimately we are letting them eat too much. We're in charge of their food, so it is ultimately our responsibility, not necessarily theirs. A little last bit there, less toys. So this may be a little less dramatic and maybe not always true, but overweight and, overweight and obese pets 
cost more money. We spend more money on them for the food that they consume because they are consuming more food. That does cost money. And every veterinarian will tell you that overweight and obese animals have more illnesses. And because of that, you're spending more money on that. And therefore, that there's less money in your wallet to do fun things with your animals. So less toys, less whatever it is that your animal likes because um, if you're on a budget, you're spending that money um, for things that you wouldn't have to spend it for if you were actually having, um, or you hopefully wouldn't have to spend it for if you had an animal that was um, the proper size. So risk factors, certainly there's your endogenous factors, the animal's age, sex, reproductive status, if you've altered them or not. Uh, there are a lot of things that make an animal um, more likely to become, become heavy. So any presence of hormonal abnormalities or hypothalamic lesions or hypothalamic abnormalities and genetic predisposition. Animals who have been bred for hundreds and hundreds of years to be outside and sporting all the time and then we bring them inside and put them on a couch. Uh, their body is built to, to burn calories by exercising and then we, we don't let them do that, that exercise. So, um, so there's a lot of kind of your internal reasons why an animal might be more likely to be heavy. There's also your exogenous reasons, and that's um, their voluntary activity level. Not every lab wants to swim all the time. Not every, you know, Jack Russell Terrier is hyper. So we have that genetic predisposition, but there's also that individual level where some just um, are a little bit lazy or a little bit more hyper than others. There's the external influences on food intake. So that could go back to behavior. Some dogs eat more because the dog next to them is eating more, or they eat less because they live in a stressful environment. So there is, you know, it's not all about genetics and all about hormones. There's, there's internal in that one animal things that happen. The diet composition and the diet palatability. They might not like the way something tastes or feels in their mouth. Um, I could even put like tooth issues in there, but um, that's, that's kind of crossing across both boundaries. The living environment and type of lifestyle also helps with that. So um, that could be you are a very active person and you take them with you everywhere you go, or you're a very active person and you're so active you can't take them everywhere you go and they are actually alone and not moving very much. So living environment, um, the lifestyle of the person, of the animal, do you have a really big backyard and they get to run and play, or do you live on the you know, 57th floor of a building and they, they hardly ever get to go outside and play. That really is a kind of a, a risk factor or a risk type. Treatment. Um, the, the main treatment for an animal being too heavy is you want to reduce the body fat stores. And we can do this, and we can do this much easier than we can with, um, with ourselves because you know, they don't have the same social parameters for eating and the same social needs. This is just um, simply, we are changing their diet because we know what's best for them. Even if they beg or if they plead, they are still, um, we still control the food. So dietary modification would be stop free choice feeding. Don't let them have food all the time. Have meal time. Um, that can be stressful at first, and you might have to do it um, such that you're feeding them you know, five little meals in a day, maybe over a, a, a holiday weekend or something where you're there longer. And so you, you gradually stop having food there all the time instead of just one big change, especially for cats. You stop giving table scraps or any human food. Um, you offer your attention instead of treats. You play with them, um, so you're giving them you instead of giving them things. It could even be um, getting some new toys as well. Keeping pets out of the kitchen when you're, when you're doing any meal prep. It's so easy to just you know, drop an extra little, even something as silly as a green bean on the floor because they're there and they're begging and they're following you around. And sometimes it's even to kind of keep them at a safe distance. If you're gonna open the oven and they're there, so you, you give them a toy on the other side of the kitchen or give them a treat on the other side of the kitchen so that they're at a safe distance. Either way, keep them out of there and then you haven't got to deal with them. Altering the diet amount or altering the diet type, less calories in um, is the goal. So however you do it, less calories in. And whether you 
alter the diet amount or change it so that you give them the same amount, it's just um, a more filling or more fiber rich food with less calories um, is really up to you and the, the dog or cat and their, their reaction to what's happening. There are, there are books on the benefits of both types. There are books on the, um, on the concerns on both types. It really kind of depends on your animal and the stress that it causes if you start reducing the diet. I just said stress. Um, so with that stress, you really do want to make sure that you're doing whatever treatment you're using is the least stressful for the animal as possible. They did not gain all that weight overnight. They're not going to lose it all overnight. So your goal is to have that animal slowly reducing their body, their body weight, body mass, and as long as they're going down, it hasn't got to happen super fast. In fact, slower, the healthier, the better. So um, again, if you're modifying that diet, just think about the animal, think about their stress, and yeah, they're not going to like the fact they're not getting these things anymore. But at the same time, if you are going to cut out, say, your fatty liver treats, um, maybe they really like ice, so you're switching those to ice. Or maybe they really like carrots, or they really like green beans, and you can give them something that's less calorically dense, but you're still giving them something. So find ways to still make them less stressed, but, but also get less calories in them. You can also um, let them exercise more, moderate, regular. This really depends on the age of the animal, the health of the animal. Not all animals that are overweight or obese can, can exercise a whole lot more. Um, so you have to, again, really take the individual aspect into it, but raise the daily energy expenditure as much as, um, as healthy for that animal. So if you used to walk them to um, the stop sign at the end of your road, maybe you walk them 100 yards past that the first day, and then you know that first week, and then you go 200 yards, and then 300 yards, and um, it's going to take more time for you, but maybe it won't. Maybe if they're a slow walker to begin with because they were heavy, um, as they start slowly losing weight, you're actually going um, the same or further distance in the same amount of time because they're actually able to go further. Um, the, the moderate exercise will actually help in regulation of food intake. So the animals may be, um, they're, maybe they're more tired, so they're going to eat less because of boredom. They're going to um, be more excited about the walk or whatever it is. They may be, they just may have less food intake. This will also increase lean tissue and lean tissue is more metabolically active, which is healthier for the animal, helps burn the calories faster, and then hopefully a decline in their overall metabolic rate. This, again, doesn't happen overnight. This is a, a slow process. If you are, um, if you've ever been to exercise classes or watched some of the exercise programs on TV, it talks about um, a human problem is that we, um, if you think about meals as a fire, that we have a fire for breakfast, we have a fire for lunch, and then we have a fire for dinner. And that oftentimes um, we have those meals so far apart that the fire has completely gone out before we light the next fire. And the goal for a lot of those programs would be is that we have a smaller fire that we burn all day. And that's kind of where we're after for animals too. That instead of, um, instead of having them um, kind of stop and start metabolically, that they burn all day and I'm sure that again you guys have been in exercise classes and, and all that where they talk about um, increasing your metabolic rate so that you're burning calories longer same idea with cats and dogs that if you go for a really slow but long jog um, your body is going to burn burn longer when you're sitting on the couch so that's again same thing for our dogs and cats so I spent an awful lot of time talking about overweight and obese animals. I do that because you see those numbers, you see those percents, and it is a true problem for our animals. I don't um, want to negate the fact that we have animals that are underweight um, for many different reasons. That's also a huge concern. In fact, almost everything on that list that I, that I showed a minute ago, and I'll, I'll show it again now, problems that arise from excess weight, many of these things would develop also from, from being underweight a little bit differently, but still um, underweight concerns are also an issue. We don't, we don't want to focus so heavily on overweight and obesity that we, um, that we flip to 
far to the side of the coin. We want our animals to be truly a healthy body condition score. Not over, not under, but but their, their optimal size because, again, we can do that even easier for them than we can do it for ourselves. Our next focus here is um, food or nutrient allergies and intolerances. That's um, kind of a big, a big thing right now in, um, in the human world, but it's also a big thing in our, in our companion animal world. So we talk about food hypersensitivities. As you can see from this chart here, um, food hypersensitivities are divided into our non-allergic um, food hypersensitivities, which is really your food intolerances, if you, if you will, um, and then your food allergies. And then your allergies are, you know, your IgE-mediated and then your non-IgE-mediated. And I'll define these a little bit more on the, on the next couple of slides, but the food hypersensitivity um, that are, that are non-allergic are still uncomfortable. They're still not healthy for the animal, but they're not immune-mediated. So that could be um, an animal that's lactose intolerant. So that's uncomfortable. It could ultimately lower the immune system if, if it's bad enough, but for that one-time thing, it's just uncomfort. Um, it can be extreme uncomfort or it can be mild uncomfort. It can also be um, irritable bowel syndrome. It could be someone who has a specific reaction to a certain spicy food where they just um, make some feel nauseated or vomit or whatever. There are um, many different food intolerances. So um, it can be toxic um, reactions, pharmacological reactions, but normally it's just something that that animal um, just cannot tolerate the way that others within the same species can. The food allergy we'll talk about on the next slide, and that's um, when neither, while all food hypersensitivities are uncomfortable and none are something that you want your animal to have, in general we do worry a little bit more about the food, the food allergy ones. I will tell you that a lot of textbooks um, lump everything under food allergy, um, and that's just because sometimes for the average owner it's just really hard to understand which it is. But um, I don't think any of you are the average owner, and I think all of you should be able to tell the difference between um, a food intolerance and a true food allergy. And that's where we're headed on this next slide. Food allergies, dogs and cats with food allergies are typically allergic to proteins, often specific amino acids, which come from animal or plant-based ingredients that are in the diet. The best way, and many people would say the only way, to tell what food your animal truly is allergic to um, is an elimination diet. And I'll show you an example on the next slide about that. And with the food allergy, while sometimes we kind of foo-foo it or push it to the side, whether it's you with a you know, food allergy, a slight food allergy to peanuts, or you with a slight allergy to green beans or, or whatever it is, a true allergic reaction is an immune system involved reaction and that is potentially um, a life risk, whether it's your dog or your cat or you. So while they may be mild on a Monday and mild again on a Tuesday, what happens on Thursday and Friday isn't always as easy to predict. So food allergies, um, again, we worry about because your immune system is involved and what's happening with your immune system, how is it reacting, and is there a chance that you're going to have a more systemic reaction in the future and um, and that's again really what we're worried about there. This is um, a, a quick example of a food trial. Um, I'm just this is a it's just a peteducation.com website. It's just a media website. There's there's tons that are um, very very similar but I like this one just because it's um, it kind of quickly shows you um, what I'm talking about with a food trial. Food trials, um, almost all food trials would recommend that that animal um, is on a food trial for at least 12 weeks. So we're talking three months of, of a food trial. And with that, we typically are using a, um, what we call a, an allergic diet. So it's, um, we're trying to make sure that there's nothing in that diet that could potentially cause a concern. And sometimes, um, if we are pretty sure we know what allergen is, we just take that one thing out and nothing else. 
but oftentimes we don't know what it is, so we just do a, um, a specific um, hydrolytes protein diet or veterinary recommended diet, and that's all you feed for three, the, three months, and you're trying to see what happens. These diets are very difficult for owners to switch over to for their pets because their pets typically don't like them, they're not happy, and the owners start cheating. They start cheating by giving treats or rawhides or pig ears or cow hooves or they've given their medications with something, some type of food. They're giving some type of toothpaste with something in it. They're giving toys that have something in it. Um, all the stuff becomes a problem and owners Forget that. Um, you have to make sure that you have to be very careful what you're what you're giving them. Um, that you're not letting them eat off the floor. That if you let them cheat on their birthday at week six, you have to start over again because whatever reaction happened there could mess up whatever you're trying to figure out. That you need to make sure that they're not playing in your yard and eating something in your yard or um, stealing a treat from somebody else outside. You need to keep a journal all these things about what your dog is doing. Food trials in dogs take a long time and the dogs don't necessarily like it and the people don't like it and that's why we have so few elimination diets. It's really easy to say, oh I think it's the chicken, I'm going to get a new bag of food or oh I think it's the corn, I'm going to get a new bag of food. That's easy and it's often incorrect. So. Um, and most of your, and this website says it, the next time you're show you says it, blood testing for allergens in dogs is just, um, is often not the way to go. This website, I believe, says it's a waste of your money. Um, my Merck Veterinary website also says um, it's not recommended. But it's also kind of a, it's also an easy out. We just don't, the, the blood tests are just not good enough yet to tell us what's really going on. Um, if you're really concerned and you have the money to do it, having the blood test and doing the elimination diet would be what I would recommend. Get that medical information and, and have it, but don't completely believe it until you actually run the diet too and see what's, what your diet showing you and what is the blood showing you. Um, and maybe even some skin scrapings or whatever, but we'll, we'll talk more about that in a few seconds. So again, um, Elimination diets are definitely what is recommended. It's just really challenging. The most common, um, and I say five here, but I added a, a couple onto the slide this morning. The most common food allergens and canines are sometimes surprising to owners, but they often reflect what we feed them. They become allergic to what's commonly fed to them. Yeah. Um, if they were allergic to things that were not in the foods, we would never see the problem, right? So it um, makes sense that they're becoming allergic to what is actually in their food. So beef, dairy, wheat, chicken, um, including eggs, lamb, and then less reported would be corn and soy. I will say that as you know, um, not only is this a food allergen issue, but we know that dogs, adult dogs are lactose intolerant. So it's also intolerance issue. So it's allergen, intolerance, all kind of um, roped in here together. The most common food allergens are in cats are also surprising to owners, and that's beef, fish, and chicken. Um, milk is less reported, but also reported, and again, that is um, an intolerance issue, maybe a true allergen issue, but also an intolerance issue as well. If you want to confirm that food allergy, a hydrolytes protein diet, roughly three months, um, is what we recommend. It's a true veterinary food. You can make it yourself, um, usually not recommended. Skin and blood tests can help. They're just not perfect. Um, I'm going to show you this website in a few seconds. But I do think, um, in particular, of the links that I'm showing you here, I would like for you to, to read this Merck Vet Manual um, Food Allergy Overview. It's, um, it's a quick, easy read, and I think it complements your course, your book, nicely. So do, um, do read this, and this is what it is over here, overview of food allergies. Um, the, some of the big points really talk about um, what we've already talked about here, and that's um, the allergic reactions, non-allergic reactions, um, kind of how on a practical level they're often clumped together, although that's not really the way it should work. In dogs, food allergy is 
around 10% as common as atopic dermatitis in dogs. So we really, long story short, we often blame the food when it's really not the food causing the problem. It's just environmental allergies like a lot of us have or parasitic allergies that, um, that we hopefully can avoid on animals in other ways. They still, there's enough food allergies out there. We need, to, we need to know what's there, but we do want to make sure that we are treating the true problem. As you read through this, it talks to you about um, the fact that it's really not gender biased. We don't see, seem to have more male dogs or um, male cats having issues than we do females. There are a few breeds that we worry about with um, food allergies a little bit more than others. Although it's not always, um, it's not always proven. So there's a lot of speculation out there. Um, as you read through this article, it'll talk a little bit about cats as well and how we do see a little bit more Persians. And we, um, but long story short, read through this. I do think, um, I think you'll um, enjoy reading it and, and, and learn a lot about um, the animals around you and food, um, again, hypersensitivities and, and the problems. So, I know this is an awfully big slide, but allergies are one of the most common issue, um, issues that we see. It's a very common insurance veterinary claim for dogs. Voter cost estimates are huge. Um, they run from around $100 for initial test. Um, some would say that those tests are probably, um, it might be better to just go straight into the food trial instead of doing the blood test, but um, either way, around 100 for that initial test to over $1,000 per year um, for very severe cases. Cat numbers and costs are not published, but they're likely quite similar. And um, for cats, the food allergies are the third most common type of allergy um, with, again, um, parasitic being second and environmental being first. And that's true for, that's true for um, both species that, um, that while they are a problem, they are fortunately less of a problem than the other two. So dogs can have um, both environmental and food-related allergies. Oftentimes, a dog who's allergic to something environmental and something parasitic is also um, more sensitive to food items. So it can be three things working together. And so even if you fix the food part and you haven't fixed the environmental part or the parasitic part, it may just all keep going on and you see so may have to really work to fixing all the allergens not just those for diets we often see um, for labeling and, and you name it we'll see immune stimulating components promoted for better skin less allergies and that kind of stuff so um, I think by now you know when labeling that um, you'll see a lot of that sometimes antioxidants so it can be your selenium and your vitamin E or um, even zinc has promoted for that, or it can be your omega-3 fatty acids, sometimes fish oils or flaxseed oil or DHA or EPA. Another one that we often see for that is um, green-lipped mussels. Um, green-lipped mussels were kind of a fad a few years ago, not so much anymore because of some environmental capture concerns and um, less of consistency um, in what you're getting when you're purchasing that, but, but still that's what you might sometimes see on, on dog food bags sardines, um, that's all potentially beneficial, but um, not, not proven is what we should say. And, and that's where with your dog, with your cat, um, just make sure that if you're trying something different to alleviate problems, that you've, um, before you just start throwing in fish oils, that you've identified that they actually truly have an immune reaction first. Make sure they really have that allergy. And again, I've heard on that quite a bit. So despite a lot of owner opinions, only about 10% of all skin allergies in canines are thought to be food related. So your textbook tells you that. I'm telling you that. The Merck Veterinary link tells you that. It's just, um, that's just the way it is. Unfortunately, um, owners often go for what's easy and easy is changing the food. Changing the food too quickly though, and without knowing if it's a true allergy, can cause GI upset, and it confuses the identification of the true problem. So don't get on a bandwagon with yourself or with your with a client. Know, know, what the, know what the real problem is. Be patient, identify it. 
It's not always easy, but it, but even if it's a long process to figure it out, you'll finally know it, and you, then you, that knowledge is power. You'll know what you can actually not feed your animal, and, and you know what to look for, and um, it's so much more, it's so much better in the long run. That three months out of a 15-year lifespan for your dog really, really is worth it. Cats often change diets even more poorly, and therefore you really should um, make sure that before you're just jumping ship and changing all those diets, that you're really thinking about the long term of your animal. Um, you just, there's a lot to it. So we've talked a lot in this lecture. We talked about obesity. We talked about being overweight. We talked about um, your food sensitivities or hypersensitivities. And, and with that, this being your last lecture, I want to take um, the opportunity to thank all of you for taking this class this semester. I have severely really, um, enjoy, enjoyed every single um, one of you, all of our interactions, um, and how we're all learning this together. And um, I hope that you're able to take something away from this class that, um, that helps you become a better pet parent, but also help other people become um, better around you as you're giving advice. And, and as you um, go out into the workforce, stay in touch. Let me know where you're at. And, um, let me know how, how things are happening. I, um, I like to stay in touch with all of you. So anyway, um, with all that said, I am um, I'm cutting off this recorder and let me know or Tara know um, anytime you have questions or concerns. Best always.